Ephesians, the first chapter, if you recall, we've, we, we stepped away for a couple weeks because of Easter and such. Uh, we were doing a mini-series in the, the study we've been doing on a healthy church to talk about the theology of the blood of Christ. And uh, again, today, here we are at the Eucharist, and that's important to us. The cup. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Uh, there's your theology of the new covenant. The blood of the new covenant is an enormous theology principle. And we're studying the nine doctrines in the cup. When you drink this cup, he says, do this in remembrance of me. And the contents of the cup is about the doctrine of the theology of the new covenant blood, the new covenant theology of the blood of Christ. So we have studied reconciliation, redemption, uh, propitiation. We've studied uh, justification, purification called cleansing. And today we talk about forgiveness. This is well worth your time to go back and look at this because when you take part in the Eucharist, you're taking part in the theology of the new covenant blood of Christ. What does the cup represent? For the believer who believes that Christ died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead, being the gospel, when you believe that, then the cup, is about what salva is a, it's a cup of salvation. When Jesus drank it, it was a cup of our sin. When we drank it, it's a cup of our salvation. But few people understand what the cup represents. They say where the cup represents the blood of Christ. Yes. But listen to me. <clears throat> what does the blood represent? If it's a cup of salvation, and it is, and it is the blood of Christ, and it is, then what does it represent about your salvation? And here's the answer. It rep represents your, re your reconciliation, your redemption, your propitiation. It represents at least nine major features of what it means to be saved. <clears throat> so what we've done is we've, we've, we are in the process of studying these nine doctrines of the theology of the blood of Christ. You need to know what is involved in your salvation other than the fact that he died for your sins and was buried and raised from the dead. That's sufficient to get you saved. Listen to me. But it's not sufficient for you to take part in the Eucharist with remembrance. If you're going to do it in remembrance, then you have to do it in what the cup represents. The, it represents the blood of Christ, and under the new covenant, there is a theology connected to it, and we call it redemption and reconciliation and propitiation, all these words. But do you know what it means? Do you know where to find it in the Bible? So we've settled down, and we're going through each one of these specifically. Today, we're looking at the word forgiveness. Forgiveness, which is a, a major issue for us, this takes us to the sixth of the nine factors of communion with God in our salvation, which a cup represents. And it, it, you need to have a working knowledge of what it means to be redeemed or what it means to be forgiven. So we're going to go to Ephesians before our word of prayer and read our, our lesson text. In our lesson text, What's really important about our lesson text is that it starts in verse 3 and goes all the way to verse 14. Now, I'm only going to read 7 and 8, but you need to know that if you, if you have a study Bible, it's going to tell you it's going to have a little marking there, and it's going to start at 3, and you won't find that little marking of a paragraph until you get to 14. Have you got a study Bible? Take a look at that. There's a little marker in a study Bible. By verse 3, there would be a little marker right next to verse 3. If it was a hymn book, it would look like one of those things that started a stanza. There's a little marker there. And you, you run through and you'll see 
that goes all the way to verse 14 before you have another marker, a paragraph divider. Are you with me? What is interesting about this, now listen to me, verse 3 through verse 14 is one Greek sentence. That's a long sentence, isn't it? That's one, that's one sentence. That's one complete thought. One complete thought. That, that's, one, that's one sentence in the Greek Bible. Okay? It's one of the longest. Now, down in verse 7 and 8, you really have to understand that. In verse 7 and 8, in him, you see verse 7? Does your Bible, when you come to the word him, does your Bible have some kind of mark near the capital H? Is there any kind of a little mark by it? There should be. And that tells you to look at your references, right? That, that's a clue to look at a reference. So look at verse look at v verse 7 over in your reference center, and here's what that little mark's going to tell you. It's not translated him. It's translated whom. Are you with me? Pay attention to that stuff. That's... Somebody has gone to a lot of work in your study Bible to lay all that out for you. It doesn't say in him. It says in whom. Now, we're talking about the same person. We're talking about Jesus Christ. But the difference between him and whom is the difference between a personal pronoun and a relative pronoun. And the relative pronoun is what is used here. It's the, it's the word hos. And the reason it's whom is because this is the subject of verses 3 through 14. God sending his son. Now, you'd have to read 3 through 14. I don't want you to do it now, but you ought to do it later. Okay? Now, it's not going to change the meaning the him or the whom. But it's going to change the way you should look at the translation of it. All right. So we'll say, in him or whom, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. See that? Look, redemption and forgiveness are connected in this subject matter. If you got one, you got the other. It, we're talking about the nine factors, and he comes back to talk about that. In him or in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to, watch, the riches of his grace. In your head, not verbal, not out loud, but in your head, in your head right now, say the riches of grace. In your head. Because he's going to tell you something about it in verse 8. The riches, say rich, in your head, say riches of his grace. Now watch. Verse 8. Which goes back to the riches of his grace. Which? The riches of his grace. Which? He lavished. You know what lavish is? Giving more than you can need or use in any given time. Right? Lavish in the Greek means to be in the maximum. You're at the top of your earning power or whatever. It, it's, but this is grace. It, 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 has, it's, it, it is the word for maximum. You go, well, what's greater than maximum? There is nothing. <laughs> You've hit the top. There is nothing greater than lavish. In the Greek language... It was hitting the top. You're at the top of the pay scale. There's not another one. You're at the top. It's translated in English, lavish. The riches of his grace, which he lavished. Watch this now. Which he lavished on us 
which he, and then there's a period. Yeah, there shouldn't be, but there is. Okay? That's just kind of interesting. We're after the idea of forgiveness. Forgiveness out of the riches of his grace, which has been lavished upon us. If you're redeemed, you're forgiven. If you're forgiven, you're forgiven on the basis of grace, and you're forgiven on the basis of grace to its maximum. Now, who did that? God. How did he do it? Through Christ. How do you get it? Believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what you get is grace maxed out. What you get out of grace being maxed out, what you get is forgiveness maxed out. You ought to be thankful this morning. You ought to be thankful. And listen, that's what God gives you. That's what God's given you. And he never takes it back. When I was a kid growing up, we called that an Indian giver. Now, I don't know where that came from. Okay. Must have been in our trading wars or something. I don't know. Not an Indian giver. You don't give it and then take it back. Well, of course, you can't use any of those phrases anymore. It's not acceptable. So probably most of you don't even know what I meant by it. Now, I don't know what the origin of it is. I just know we used it. All right, most of so, Well, if you're my age, you do, or they're close to it. Well, let's open with a word of prayer, and we'll get into this study on, listen, forgiveness that comes with a package of grace is given to you and maxed out. Because of grace now, not because of anything else. The riches of his grace has maxed forgiveness out, maxed it out. You can never run out of God. Listen, there's nothing in your life that will ever run out of forgiveness by God. Oh, you say, Ron, I've done something. Nah, <laughs> it's not about you. It's about what Christ provided for you. That's grace. You didn't earn forgiveness. You don't earn to keep it. God gave it to you in Christ, and he gave it to you maxed out under the principle of grace. Grace maxes it out. That's a wonderful concept of salvation by grace. Through faith and not of yourself, it is a gift. Let us pray. Well, our Heavenly Father, we are thankful of these who have come our way to study with us under the principle that we can't learn nor live the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. And here is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, you, Father, are faithful and just to forgive us, what? <laughs> and to forgive us? Oh, thank you. Thank you because our life has been maxed out with the principle of forgiveness through Christ. You forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I thank you for that grace principle. And not only the riches of grace, but the riches of grace lavished upon us. How thankful we should be for that. How thankful we should be for that. Teach it to us today, this morning, Father, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Because we have identified personal sin as overt sins or sins of the tongue or mental attitude sins, and we've been willingly understandably come to confess them so that we can have the ministry of the Holy Spirit teach us the truth and this wonderful idea of forgiveness so that when we take part in the Eucharist today, we can have an, a deep appreciation of remembrance of the theology of the blood of Christ in regard to forgiveness in Jesus name. Amen. Well, here we are. We've we have now worked our way down to number six in the charts. We are now number six in the charts.
uh, working towards number nine. And so all of the nine are important to the Eucharist. For example, on your paper, we, we identified 1 Corinthians 11.25. This cup is a new covenant. In my blood, uh, do this often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And what you're to remember about him is what was provided in the cup. <clears throat> the blood. What did the blood? What is the, the new covenant theology of the blood of Christ? Is what we're identifying for you today in the sixth of nine elements of the cup. So today we're going to look at four ideas before we take a break and do the Eucharist. Ephesians 1, 7 through 8 teaches that every person believing the gospel of Jesus Christ receives God's judicial forgiveness at the moment of grace salvation. I can't tell you how important that is. It's a subject the church has lost over the last 25 years. When I first came to Christianity, this was clearly taught because they taught about Adam's original sin. It's not taught anymore. Not, I don't mean it's never taught by anybody because there are men out there that understand the truth of this deal. But the reason they've taken away the judicial forgiveness is because they don't teach Adam's original sin anymore. Therefore, they don't teach that every person is under Adam's sin is under 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin. <clears throat> and uh, because of that, many years ago, we wrote a little pamphlet called 50 Things You Receive. <clears throat> my pastor, when I finally left him, uh, went into my own ministry, he was at 43. <clears throat> That's how I discovered it. <clears throat> he was at 43. And uh, I don't know where he ever found, wound up, but I, I quit at 50. I quit at 50. I was up into 80-something. And it just, it, it, I mean, who's going to even do that? So I broke it down. I stopped at 50 and broke it down into areas of, that I thought would be important for you to study. My whole purpose in that was to identify 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin that's upon all mankind. When you read Romans, the first five chapters, this is what Paul is trying to explain to the Romans and to the church. For example, in Romans 5.12, wherefore is by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. He's talking about spiritual death and death by sin. And so spiritual death passed upon all men for all have sinned. How is that possible that everybody has sinned? How did that happen? Uh, we're under the same sin. Every human being is under the same sin. It can't be personal because we're not under the same personal sin. It can't be personal sin. It's Adamic, and he tells you that in Romans 5. He says it's Adamic. And there are 13 judicial charges, and I thought it was important, so we put it as w one of the parts. The moment you believe the gospel of Christ, these 13 things, alienation and all that stuff, you can pick it up. If you're on the Internet with us today, go to doctrinalstudies.com, and when you get onto our webpage, you will see 50 things. Click on it, and you've got it. We don't, we don't sell anything around here, and we don't hide anything around here. We lay it all out there on the table, and if you want to pick it up. The only thing we tell you, if you go on our Internet and pull anything down, you don't charge for it. You don't write some book and then charge for it. We don't, we don't go for that. Everything operates under grace here, and so we would not be happy with the idea that you would pull down our material and sell it. We wouldn't be happy with that at all. I don't have control over that because I put it out under grace. I'm just asking you to be honorable. We don't do that. We want everybody to have it. If you have an Internet, if you don't have an Internet, you want that material, write us and we'll send it to you. There will be no charge to you. We, that's not how we operate under the grace principle. But... Here we are in this idea of judicial forgiveness. And I want you to understand that you get judicial. When you get saved, 
the forgiveness you're talking about is a great package. It covers the unbeliever's life and the believer's life. The blood of Christ covers both areas. It covers the unbeliever's life and it covers the believer's life. When it covers the unbeliever life, it's dealing with judicial sin. It's dealing with judicial. And what you get, Adam's original sin, and what you get is forgiveness. You can never be charged with it because if you die in Adam's sin, you're going to go to the great you're going to go to the great white throne judgment and be cast into a lake of fire. Now that's the truth. I don't care what anybody that's the truth. You can read this in Revelation 20. And you can read it in John 3 if you want to. You read it in the book. John wrote the same books. If you want to read it, John wrote it in chapter 3 and wrote it again in chapter 20 of Revelation. You can, if you abide, if you abide under the judgment, you abide under the wrath, in the end, that's where it's going to take you. It doesn't have to do that because Christ, God sent Christ to resolve this thing. There's a first Adam and a second Adam in 1 Corinthians 15, 22. The first Adam brings spiritual death. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, brings spiritual life. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 22 compared with verse 45. Look, get you a good study Bible and start studying it. I'm not telling you anything's not in your Bible. Just get a good study Bible. Invest in something. Listen, invest in your future. The only thing you're going to carry out of this world naked is the word of God that's in your soul. Nothing else. You won't carry the Bible out unless it's in your soul. Not going to carry the physical Bible out. Now, so what you get at salvation is judicial forgiveness. All those 13 charges of Adam's sin are removed from your life can never be brought back because they were paid for by one death of Jesus Christ on one cross at one time, over and out, done. Never going to pay for any of that again. Law of double jeopardy. Never going to be charged with that crime again. You were charged. He paid the penalty for you, and it's done. When you believe that Christ died on that cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and that is the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. When you believe it, Romans 1, 16, the gospel, what I just explained, the gospel is the power of God to save those who believe. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, believing, and not of yourself is a gift of God, not of works, least any man boast. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Romans 1, 16, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You ought to get it in your soul because that's the gospel. That's the message the world needs to hear from us. And so God's judicial, judicial grace forgiveness is given into every person who believes that Jesus Christ died for their sin, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. Now back to Ephesians 1, 7, and 8 in the Greek language. I want to show you just a little bit. I explained in my introduction that verses 3 through 14 is one Greek sentence. In him should be in whom. It's in plus the locative of place, a place that is a person. It's a relative pronoun, locative singular masculine. In him we have echo, which is a present active indicative. Present tense means continuous action, just like in English language. And what he means by present tense is always or eternal. In whom we have the eternal redemption. Now listen to me. You ought to write on your paper Hebrews 9.12 where he calls it eternal redemption. He refers to it here, and he actually says it in Hebrews 9.12 as a cross-reference for you. Redemption through his, there's a definite article in the Greek language, the blood, which is a big deal. There's a definite article with the blood. The forgiveness, there's a definite article with the word forgiveness. Of our trespasses, there's a definite article with the trespasses in the Greek language, which is referring to judicial. It's referring to Genesis 2.17. 
where Adam sinned. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This is brought out in Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 1, where he says, in Adam you are dead in your trespasses and sin. What, what's trespasses? It's a violation. You violated. It's Adam. Adam. It's in Adam. You are dead in Adam. What did I do to get? You got born to human being. <laughs> you got born to human being rather than a wolf or a cat or a pig or something. And Adam sinned, and this is the boat we're in. We're in the sin boat. And you sail that ship until it stops at the cross of Jesus Christ where he died to rescue from the ship of sin and he was buried and raised from the dead and you sail away in the good old ship called eternal life. John, the fifth chapter, verse 24. John, the fifth chapter, verse 24. You ought to put it in your soul. People need to hear that. They need to hear that. And so here is Ephesians 1, 7, and 8. According to the riches of his grace, which he lavished right to the maximum. Point number two. Under the new covenant, which we're in, we're in the new covenant, and we're in the new covenant until Christ wraps up everything. We are now in the new covenant looking for Christ to return in the new covenant. And we will be in that situation until the end of human history, over and out. The only thing that's going to change in the new covenant in, the, in our historical time is closing down dispensations. He's going to come back in the second coming. He's going to close down the Jewish age. He's going to close down the church age. He's going to close down the Jewish age. And he's going to close down the millennial age, all under the new covenant. And then when that's all wrapped up, we're going to go into the new heaven and new earth and a whole new system. Hoo-ah. You should be so happy you came to this church today, I'm telling you. You won't get this information. Not one little quick setting. I just carried your little boat to a long journey, theologically. Under the new covenant, God's judicial forgiveness is given to every believer the moment he believes and receives grace salvation, which can never be lost in time nor eternity. Think about that. Don't let anybody try to take it away from you either because the devil would like to steal that information from you and cause you to live in fear rather than faith. It is based on the new covenant theology of the blood of Jesus Christ. He died one spiritual death by pouring out his blood one time forever, and he calls it eternal redemption in Hebrews 9.12. In Hebrews, the seventh chapter, verse 20 to 27, he says, who does not need daily, talking about Jesus Christ, our high priest, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. No, no, no. Jesus Christ had none, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's not something we achieve. It. It's something that's grace given. Are you familiar with that? Are you familiar with that? Listen to this. How much more, how much greater is the blood of the historical blood of Christ than shadow Christology of animal sacrifices under the old covenant? That's what he's talking about. For those who go, went through chapters 8, 9, and 10 with me in Hebrews know this well. How much more with the blood of Christ? much more, the historical blood of Christ on the cross of Calvary, how much greater is it than all the blood that was shed by animals until the coming of Christ? There's no comparison. The word how much more means there's no comparison. It was a glimpse to the future when Christ would come and die on a cross one time.
because he did once for all when he offered up himself. This young man goes into a, a synagogue and shoots a bunch of Jews because they killed his Messiah. Because he, they killed his Christ. That's not true. That's not true at all. God sent his son to die on a cross. And the son offered himself. Nobody took it. Nobody took it. Nobody was great enough to take the life of the Son of God. That's absolute evil thinking. My heart aches for that kind of foolishness in America. What kind of, where does that stuff come from? When you see these words, he offered up himself. Nobody took his life. Nobody took his life. Nobody. He said, I voluntarily lay my life down. No man, no man takes my life from me. Let me tell you something else. Nobody takes your life from you either. There is nobody has more power than God if all of the world combined tried to take your life and God said no way, he would destroy them all. Somebody hold a gun to your head, you tell them it better be made of candy because you're going to have to eat it. I hope that gun is made out of chocolate because this is going to be the worst day in your life. Nobody has that power over your life but God himself. You belong to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ belongs to God, John the 10th, chapter 28 through 30. And no one, no one, no one, no one can take your life without permission. And when God gives permission, it's for a greater cause, just like the life of his own son. Nobody. Now listen to the world tell you that kind of foolishness. They don't have that kind of power. You can call down fire from heaven. Nobody has that kind of power. Don't give it to them. Nobody has that kind of authority over your life. You've been bought, lock, stock, and barrel, and you're better off for it. We live in one of the most fearful ages that I've been attached to my entire life. We're afraid of our shadow. Because we don't have any confidence in the grace of God can secure us. You got saved by grace. You live by grace. You'll die by grace. It's all about grace, and grace is all about God. <laughs> Jeez. You be sure to pray for Gary Horton. That warrior really needs our prayers. We need to put his feet back in his boots and his boots on the field. We've opened up Sinclair County for him. 22 high schools, and we intend to be in them next year. And let me tell you, his test is not his, it's ours. 
His test is not his. It's ours. Church must pray for him. Get him off that sick bed. Put boots back on his field. That's a warrior. And put those boots out there where it needs to be. Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I spend every day in the phone with him. Encouraging him and keeping his spirit. Intact. Nobody has this kind of power over your life. Not even sickness. Don't give it, don't give it over for that. The only thing you give your life over to voluntarily is God. Give it to nobody else. Point number three. Oh, let me finish point two right at the bottom of your paper. I love this little phrase. Now where there is. We overlook these little things that are kind of like, whoo, that's pretty important. Now where there is, now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. <laughs> oh, Ron, you just don't know. I, just, I don't know, but I just got myself in a peck of trouble, and I'm just in the sin up to my eyeballs, and oh, my goodness. Man. Nah. You going to stay there and whine? What do you do? When you've got personal sin in your life as a believer. Now where there is forgiveness of him. Will God forgive you if you confess your sins? I don't care what you've done. Will God forgive you if you confess your sins? For Psalm 9 says so. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why do you let the devil lie to you and keep you down in the, in the pit? Why do you let him lie to you? Uh, I can't get up. I know the worst thing. Uh, quit whining and confess your sin and get back on your feet. No, I, I suppose I'm preaching to somebody on the internet. So just ignore me if I get a little excited and get a little loud. Apparently, it's not for you. It's for them. They need to have me shout a little bit at them today. I, that's the way I was raised. Point number three, the justice. You know the mercy seat? The Old Testament mercy seat in the, in the holies of holies, that little mercy seat? You know, that, you know where that mercy seat is today? Inside your body. <laughs> yeah, your body's the naos. The naos is because you have accepted the fact that the mercy seat or the atoning blood of Jesus Christ operates from what the two cherubims on the mercy seat represented, mercy, the, the, listen, the righteousness and justice of God is where you get mercy. And where mercy is, is where atonement is. And where atonement is, is the nine things in the theology of the blood of Christ. Ah, oh, yeah. The justice of God forgives and releases the one believing the gospel. From judicial guilt, 13 judicial charges, on the basis of the theology of the blood of Jesus Christ. The new covenant theology of the blood of Christ is the name of the game. And it amazes me that the believers that live in the new covenant church age don't understand it. This is why God has brought you to us. So we're going to pound this out. We're going to pound this out until you get it. We're going to keep pounding it out until you get it. Avesis, the Greek word for forgiveness, is used by Paul in Ephesians 1, 7, and 8. I used it in the noun form. And it means to remit or to forgive. It's used in Matthew 6, 12. 
Our Father who art in heaven for you, right? Remember that? Give us this day our daily bread. Oh, we like to quote that, but we don't like quoting the second line. <laughs> oh, yeah, everybody give me this day our daily bread. Oh, boy, we're all over that one. But how about the second stanza? If you're going to sing that song, sing the second one. What? Forgive us our debt. Uh-huh, uh-huh, come on. Forgive us our debt. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Forgive us our debt. Uh-huh. As we what? Forgive our debtors. Oh, yeah, we like to sing the first part of that and don't like the second part of it. This is what we're talking about. Sermon on the Mound, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Sermon on the Mound. Our Father who in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Oh, where? On earth. Where? Right here. Right here. Oh, yeah. On earth. Where on earth? Right here. Where's your address? Right here. On earth. On earth as it is in heaven. Uh, we like to talk about heaven. We don't like to talk about responsibility. We don't like responsibility, do we? This word in the Greek means to dismiss, release, or forgive. It's just used this way in Ephesians 1.8 and the sister book, Colossians 1.14. It's used in Ephesians 1.7 and Colossians 1.14 for the unbeliever. And it's used in 1 John 1, 9 for the believer. Forgiveness covers it all. The unbeliever and the believer. For the unbeliever, judicial forgiveness has to come by believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. For the believer who is already under that is now dealing in the relationship, fellowship with God. It's 1 John 1, 9. It's all about fellowship with the Father, not coming into relationship with him through the gospel. We're a son of God. Once you believe the gospel, you're a son of God. You'll always be a son of God. It's one of your 20 status privileges in the 50 things you can receive. You'll always be a child of God. You'll always be a child of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. There will never be a day in your life when you're not, whether you like it or not. If you liked it enough to get saved, he likes it enough to keep it. That's for sure. If the Last Supper of Jesus Christ, the Last Supper, that's what it's called, out of Matthew 26, 28, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out. Ekuno. Ekuno. The King James called it shedding. Great translation. The shedding or the pouring out. The shedding or the pouring out. For what? For what reason? You ought to circle the word for because it gives you the divine reason. The divine purpose. Listen. Jesus Christ. My blood, the blood of the covenant, new covenant, which is poured out, shed, for divine purpose, the forgiveness of sins. Why did he pour his blood out? What's the theology of it? Forgiveness of sins. Redemption, reconciliation, propitiation, justification, cleansing, purification, and forgiveness. 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 The new, co new covenant theology of the blood of Jesus Christ says that Jesus Christ poured out his blood for the sins of the world while he was still alive. Ah, oh, see, everybody misses that theology. 1 John 2, 2, uh, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for our sins, sins of the church, not only our sins, but the sins of the whole entire world. There's a first Adam and a last Adam. And that tells the whole story. One got us in and one got us out. <laughs> and you've been smart enough 
my dear people of the church, you've been smart enough to believe that Jesus came to die for your sins, be buried and raised from the dead so that he could do that for you by grace and not of yourself. It would be a gift. And you've had the, listen, no Christian should ever think that anybody in the world is smarter than you. You're smarter than them because you're saved and you know where you're going. You're smarter than the smartest, dumb, unsaved person in the world. Don't beat yourself up. If you got saved, you're the smartest person in the room. Newology, theology, listen. Jesus Christ poured out his blood for the sins of the world while he was alive. Now listen to me. When it's finished, listen to me. It's got to be done while he's alive. And when it's finished, watch that. He died. He poured out all of his blood spiritually, not literally, not literally. He poured out all of his blood. When the work was finished, he who knew no sin became sin for us. And when that work was done, when God says it's done, it's done. When God says it's done. And that occurred between noon and 3 p.m., while Christ hung on the cross, God shut the lights off off the world, shut the lights off from 12 to 3, and his son suffered while alive, poured out his self, poured out his self, poured out his self to bear our sins so that we would never have to deal with him under judicial punishment ever again or judgment. Matthew 27, 45 and 46. From the sixth hour noon, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour, 3 p.m. This is the point when Christ finished suffering for the sins of the world or poured out his blood. It's a spiritual concept. How much blood did it take? Is it the literal blood? Was it an ounce? Was it five quarts? What was the amount of blood? It wasn't based on that. It was based on him offering himself 100% to become what he could have never become any other way, but by the will of God, to become sin for the entire world. And when he has suffered enough on God's scale of value, he died. He died in our place for our sin. About the ninth hour, Christ cried out with a loud voice, and he quotes Psalms 22.1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In verse 50, he cried out again a second time with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. In other words, he died. You know why he died? Because the work was finished. Not because, not because all of the blood is out of his body. That's not why he died. He didn't die because he lost his blood. He voluntarily gave his life as the son of the only begotten son of God. For the punishment of the sin. He poured out himself. Upon the cross for our sins. And when it was finished. God called it with time. When God said it's finished. It was finished. And he gave up his spirit. And he died. For God. I hope you understand that. In John the 19th chapter verse 30. Therefore when Jesus received the sour wine. He said. Teleastai. He said it is finished. He put it in the perfect tense. The teleastai. It is finished. He bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. 
It is finished in the perfect tense. Means completed action in the past. The results and remains completed forever. The work of salvation is completed. You add nothing to it. You add nothing to it. You're not saved because you believe the gospel and do a lap in the church or walk an aisle or join a church or be baptized in order to be saved. That's not true. It is not true. He makes it very clear. When it was finished, it was finished on the cross. You add nothing to it. Christ paid it all. To all to, we owe it all to him. Right? Christ paid it all to all we owe him. All this kind of foolishness that somehow you have to do something in addition to believe the gospel of the work of Christ on the cross. You've missed what he did on the cross. Who are you to think you could add anything to the sins of the world? It's an apostasy of the church to say that. Here's what we hold to, who gave himself a ransom for all. You see, the issue is not your sin. The issue is will you believe. Sin has been paid for. The issue is not sin of your salvation. It's to understand why it's there. The issue of your salvation is will you believe that Christ paid the penalty for your sin. You know what ransom means? He paid the price to get you out of the mess you're in. That's called ransom. He paid the ransom price to get you out of the mess of Adamic sin by grace. You ought to circle these words on your paper for all. Listen, he didn't give himself for some. Another apostate theology in the church today. He didn't give his life for some. He gave it for all. Gave it for all. When I hear somebody say, well, I think I probably got left out because I'm 35 and I'm not saved yet. Well, then stop and think about the consequences for you not believing the gospel. Who is hoodwinked to you to think that you can be 35, still alive, and not get saved? I talked to a missionary friend of mine in Whitehall, Michigan, in a nursing home. And his heart is just broken and burdened by so many people on a one foot in the grave and the other banana peel, as he calls it. They won't believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. 70 and 80, 90 years of age. That will not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ that breaks his heart because he knows where they're going for sure. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And if you have eternal life, you will not come into judgment, but you have passed out of death and into life. John 5, 24. Today, after we take, come back off our break, we're going to do the Eucharist, and I want you to focus on the word forgiveness. Forgiveness. And the lesson I've taught you today, I want that to be primary in your soul today. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way. May the Holy Spirit press upon them the need of salvation by grace through faith and not of herself, not of herself, not of herself, not of ourself. It is a gift. Christ will take you under any condition that's volitional, not work-oriented, grace-oriented, saved by grace through faith and not of herself. I pray that today upon our congregation. I pray that, Father, upon those who are with us with the internet. 
Don't let the devil lie to you and deceive you and send your soul to hell. I tell you the truth. I've laid it out scripturally to you. It's time for you to believe. It's time. It's time. There is work to be done. I pray you would be saved and become a, a laborer in the vineyard of salvation. Reaching other people with the gospel of Christ around the world. The time is here. The time is urgent. The time is now. Encourage our hearts today, Father, to be great missionaries of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be ambassadors of the message of reconciliation and the great, the great message of forgiveness as taught today. Take the offering that we're about to receive, Father. May we be good stewards of it to reach the maximum number with the least amount of money by sending the appropriate people like Josh Knapp and Rick and so many others. Gary Horton. May they be ministers of the gospel and truth to a dying world that needs the message more than ever in Jesus' name. Amen.